tried to get support from other foundations like the National Science Foundation and private foundations, and he got some, but it wasn't enough to really um, keep the laboratory going at the level that it had been. Uh, and so he took early retirement and moved to California. Four, uh, he presented a at a meeting of the American Society for Cybernetics in which he introduced the term second order cybernetics. And this was the idea that rather than designing feedback and control systems and regulatory systems, we're gonna apply all this to understanding the observer. This had been their interest all along, but they sort of defined the field in this way. And I received my PhD in 1975, so this was right at the time I was leaving and going off someplace else. Uh, but I missed the uh, excitement of the Biological Computer Laboratory, so in the next moment I'll tell you how I dealt with that. But uh, basically what we did was we thought the idea of second order cybernetics was a really neat idea that it would transform not just one field, but all of science. So, and Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, had been published in around 1970. And so we said, let's make a scientific revolution. Okay, so we did. We set off to make a scientific revolution, and I think we succeeded in the next 20 so years. At least we managed to persuade those who were willing to listen. <laughs> it wasn't a large group. But we managed to formulate a set of arguments that are pretty persuasive, and I'm going to present them to you here today, so we'll see if I persuade you as well. Something else happened around 1975, and that was it was 30 years after 1945, which meant that the ultra secret re was revealed. This is the Enigma machine, et cetera. The ultra secret was the secret that the British was reading the messages of the German high command during World War II. Uh, and that helped us to understand many things. For example, World War II gave Americans the idea that they were pretty capable people. In other words, they could be attacked, they could mobilize, invade, and achieve unconditional surrender within four years. And that's, that belief in your own efficacy has caused lots of troubles in the period since, uh, it seems to me. But it also was an in indication of the enormous value of information in warfare, business, etc. cetera. Uh, and that certainly is the idea underlying cybernetics, that information makes a difference. I'll, return to that topic in a variety of forms as we go. Okay, so later uh, there were um, uh, some conflicts within the society, personality conflicts. They split up. There was a Washington group, a Philadelphia group, but they got back together again. Uh, while the cyberneticians were not holding meetings, the cyberneticians met with the general systems people, they're now called the International Society for the System Sciences, uh, and they've always thought of cybernetics as a subset of system science. The cyberneticians reply that, well, you're just dealing with theories, and we have a theory of theories, so you're a subset of, of our theories. And this game is played back and forth. It gets boring very quickly. Um, what the cyberneticians then did was uh, we got a grant from the National Science Foundation uh, to move into cyberspace. That is, the graduates of the Biological Computer Laboratory had spread around all over the country. The laboratory had closed. Heinz had moved to California. And, but we wanted to stay in touch. So in the late 1970s, the National Science Foundation had a program on electronic information exchange for small research communities and I put together uh, a small research community which got together all the BCL graduates and we expanded it even over into Europe. And did early work on what is now called the internet. That's basically the way I paid my way through graduate school was by getting NSF grants for what we call computer-based communications media, what we now call the internet. 
we'd create a software package, uh, ask people to use it, get their feedback on it, modify the software package, uh, et cetera. And we had a little team of graduate and undergraduate students doing that research. Then my dissertation was a reflection on what happens to a society if you put a new communications medium within it. Okay, so if you put a new medium, telephone, radio, television, or in this case, computer-based communication medium, how does the society change? That was in 1975. Okay, then, as I mentioned before, it was known that cybernetics was a big deal, or had been a big deal at one time, in the Soviet Union. Actually, it had sort of fallen into disfavor uh, cybernetics had in the Soviet Union, mainly because they realized it involved feedback, and that was sort of inconsistent with uh, the way things were operating. There's now a wonderful book out uh, by Sasha Garovich called From Newspeak to Cyberspeak, which is the history of Soviet cybernetics. and. Uh, it gets into these issues of the remarkable interplay between politics and science and the evolution of the ideas and the factions within the government and the factions within science. It's a very, very interesting story. In any case, um, I went to a conference in Toronto and sat next to a Soviet scientist named uh, Vadim Sadovsky. And I was trying to build up the American Society for Cybernetics because it was a kind of small group. People have a tendency to come into cybernetics, pick up some interesting ideas, and then take them back to their discipline. And only a few people stay with cybernetics and really uh, promote the field. So I thought, well, if we had a sort of correspondence project between the Americans and the Soviets, I could get the American scientists together to reconsider fundamentals. And Vadim thought that was a fine idea, and it turned out uh, that was the easiest project I've ever funded. And the reason was, these were the days of the evil empire. <laughs> these were the days when the Soviets were persecuting their dissident intellectuals. And as a result, academic exchanges, academic exchanges between the United States and the Soviet Union were being canceled right and left, which meant there was money on the table. Now, you know the way bureaucracies work. They have a certain amount of money for exchanges. If the exchanges are canceled, then what are you going to do with the money? <laughs> so I come along and propose this new activity, and they said, sure, we'll fund it. So, well, okay, <laughs> great. But then the scientific community started you know, objecting and saying, well, you know, we're canceling all of these things. What are you doing starting up something? And there was this big debate over whether we should do this, given the way the Soviets were treating their scientists. And finally, we came to the conclusion, well, you can't cancel something that doesn't exist. So let's go ahead and start it up. And then if they abuse some of our scientists, then we'll cancel the program and so forth. So it went forward. Uh, but along the way, I learned how Soviets negotiate, and I'll talk about that later when we talk about reflexivity theories. Lefevre, Vladimir Lefevre, was the key person in this whole enterprise. Uh, it turned out he had once shared an office with Vadim Sadovsky, who was my counterpart on the other side. But Lefevre had emigrated. He was Jewish, so he, he, it was possible for him to emigrate. Now, if you ask me, you know, how come Jews can integrate and other people can't? And that's the Soviet Union. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's strange. But nevertheless, Lefevre was able to immigrate, so he did. He's now at the University of California at Irvine, and he's been there for about, since the early 80s. <clears throat> I'll say more about Lefevre's theory later. Uh, But while I was getting involved with uh, Soviets and trying to understand cybernetics and systems theory in the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, we were also promoting second order cybernetics. Okay, this was the 1980s, so this is when we were trying to make a scientific revolution. 
So in the 1980s, we were just trying to figure out what was going on in the Soviet Union. And in this country, we were promoting second order cybernetics. And in fact, getting involved with the Soviets was simply a strategy for promoting second order cybernetics within the United States. In the beginning, I didn't have much interest in Russia, uh, except as an excuse to get the Americans together. Okay, so let me say a little bit about the distinction between first and second order cybernetics. But it, does anybody have any questions up to now? If, if you have questions, don't hesitate to interrupt. Okay, so we thought people should accept second order cybernetics. Well, what did we mean by that? Okay, it's defined in different ways by different people. Von Forster said that first order cybernetics was the cybernetics of observed systems, things that you observe. Second order cybernetics is the cybernetics of observing systems. Von Forster liked plays on words. This has two meanings. It's the act of observing, which means the human brain. Gordon Pask from Great Britain said, well, you have the purpose of the model or the purpose of the modeler. The purpose of the modeler is a larger set of concerns. Francisco Varela said that early cybernetics dealt with controlled systems. Later cybernetics dealt with autonomous systems. He was a biologist. Okay. I was interested in social systems, so I said, okay, first order, second order, then that means that in the early days, we dealt with interaction among the variables in a system, like a system dynamics model. Uh, second order cybernetics would be interaction between the observer and the observed. Or you could think of a theory of social systems or theories of the interaction between ideas and society. Uh, okay. So we did tutorials like this one. And we held our first meeting in Europe in 1987. And what that taught me, although I didn't really understand it at the time, was that Europeans are really interested in cybernetics, and particularly second order cybernetics. Americans are not. Uh, we had been trying to persuade Americans for a long time, and they just didn't get it, or they weren't interested. And over time, I've learned more about this, and I'll say more about it. But basically, the notion is that ideas are interpreted differently in different societies. Take Marxism as an example. Marxism, in the form of Das Kapital, the book, was the same every place. In the United States, it supported labor unions. That is, it said, you know, pay attention to the workers, take care of the workers, et cetera. In Western Europe, it took the form of socialist democratic parties, so that most uh, countries in Western Europe have socialist parties, which are sort of like the Democrats in this country. But in Russia and China, it took the form of a totalitarian party state. Now, the idea was the same, but the manifestation that it took in the society was different. And similarly, cybernetics has been interpreted differently in the United States and Europe. And I've come to think of it as largely a European discipline. Uh, or at least it speaks to the concerns of Europeans because Europeans are more interested in general theories than Americans. Americans are more interested in applications and specifics. And I'll say more about that later. Now, as a result of the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, in the late 1980s, uh, there was a lot of interest in the transformation of the post-communist countries from an authoritarian system to a more democratic or a free market system. Uh, it was like a large-scale social experiment. And this happened during the time when we were having meetings between Soviets and Americans. And it seemed like a wonderful case study. So we began to hold meetings every two years in Vienna where we would get together people from 
east and west. This was part of the European meetings on cybernetics and systems research, which is an ongoing series of conferences held in Vienna.